Hello. In today's video, I'd like to introduce the topic of zooarchaeology, or the analysis of animal remains from archaeological sites. It's a very large topic, and today's video will focus mainly on the identification of animal remains, as well as their sexing and aging, with a little bit on how we make reference collections that help us make those identifications. In another video, I talk about quantification, which is a topic that's very important in zooarchaeology. So I would encourage you to have a look at that video if you're interested in how we count and quantify animal remains. There are many types of evidence for animals that can occur in archaeological deposits, and here I show only the main ones. Perhaps the most obvious of these are bones. But bones don't occur in all animals, and they're also not always preserved. For animals that have them, Teeth can be a good source of evidence, even in cases where bones are not well preserved. A large proportion of the members of the phylum Mollusca have hard shells that tend to be well preserved. Sometimes archaeologists find antlers, horns, or hooves of animals. And even inconspicuous remains, like parts of insects' exoskeletons, or the spicules of sponges, or the ear stones or scales of fish. Evidence for animals can also include such things as spherolites from sheep dung, or worm castings, or bird's nests. And finally, archaeologists can use isotopic evidence for what animals some other animal may have eaten, as well as even DNA analysis that can help in the identification of animal remains. In this video, I will concentrate mainly on bones, teeth, and shells of mammals, fish, and mollusks. Only rarely do archaeologists find substantially whole skeletons of animals, like the Egyptian donkey seen here. More typically, animal remains are highly fragmented. This not only makes it more difficult to identify the animal remains, it also has substantial impacts on how we interpret them. In zooarchaeology and closely related fields, it's common to conceptualize the taphonomic effects that is, the effects that degrade the material over time, as being something like a sampling procedure that starts out with a living population, in this case of animals, that we call the life assemblage, and passes through several stages of removals and destruction processes, eventually becoming the sample assemblage that archaeologists have available to them. In describing animal remains, it's important to know the names and orientation of each part. For long bones, the proximal end is the end closest to the center of the body, while the distal end is the part away from the body, for example, towards the toes or the fingers. The central or shaft part of the long bone is called the diaphysis, and the two ends that articulate with other bones are called epiphyses. The spongy looking bone in the epiphyses is called cancellous bone. It acts somewhat like a shock absorber. Here a cross-section of the diaphysis just above the epiphysis shows the much denser cortical bone as well as a portion of the medullary cavity. The medullary cavity is where we find bone marrow in mammalian bone. There are also standard terms for the surfaces and parts of teeth. The surface towards the cheek is called the buccal side and the inner or tongue side is called the lingual side. The chewing surface of a molar is called the occlusal surface. Other major parts of the tooth include the crown and the root. There are also terms for orienting and locating teeth within an animal's mouth. Here using the upper or maxillary aspect of a dog's mouth, mesial means towards the midline of the mouth, and distal means away from the midline so that molars are more distal than canines or incisors. Similarly, there are terms for segmenting and orienting parts within an animal's whole body. Using a deer skeleton as an example, anterior means towards the front, while posterior means towards the rear, dorsal means towards the back, and ventral towards the stomach. The axial skeleton includes the skull, vertebral column, ribs, and sternum, although some archaeologists treat the head separately. The appendicular skeleton includes the pectoral girdle, or scapula, 
along with the bones of the forelimbs, and the pelvic girdle consisting of various hip bones along with the bones of the hind legs. Among the better preserved parts of bony fish are vertebrae. The drum-like part is called the centrum, with a neural spine extending from two places on the dorsal surface of the centrum. In the case of caudal vertebrae, there's also a hymal spine that extends from the ventral surface of the centrum. A very important piece of evidence for fish consists of otoliths, and especially sagittal otoliths. These are calcium carbonate features that occur in the fish's ears. We orient those with anterior and posterior ends, and dorsal and ventral edges. Finally, the two surfaces are inner or medial, meaning towards the midline of the fish, and lateral or exterior. In helicones, or snail shells, orientation is relative to the apex of the shell, beginning with the shell's axis. The direction towards the apex is called ad apical, and away from the apex is ab apical. There are also terms for the directions in which the whirls spiral. When viewed from the apex, this is normally clockwise or destral, but some helicones have counterclockwise or sinistral spiraling. The convention for orienting bivalves is with the hinge and umbo at the top. There's a left and right valve, and here you see the right one. When looking at the inner right valve, anterior is towards the left, and posterior towards the right. Since most bivalves are asymmetrical, you can use this curvature near the umbo to identify the posterior end. In a cockle shell, for example, we can easily identify the umbo and then the anterior and posterior edges of the shell. And here we see the hinge with several teeth. Scallop shells are trickier to orient because they look almost symmetrical. Here we see the upper or left valve of the scallop, which is usually rather flat or even concave as compared to the right valve. It's easy to identify the hinge on the shell, which is flanked by two protrusions or ears. When trying to identify an animal bone we haven't seen before, it often makes sense to begin with identifying which body part it represents. We can start by assigning it to one of several very general categories. Long bones are likely to come from appendicular parts of the skeleton, such as the femur or tibia. Flat bones could be cranial parts, but often come from the scapula. Irregularly shaped bones could come from a number of body parts, but they're particularly common in the vertebral column. And then there are parts that are not bones at all, such as teeth or horn or tusks. This very coarse classification allows us to focus on a narrower range of possible body parts. Next, we can examine the bone for particular features that help us identify it. For long bones, if we have at least one of the proximal and distal ends, Examining the articular surfaces can be really important because they tell us how the bone articulates with other bones. Rough areas and ridges on bones are very important because they're frequently the places where muscles attach. The cortical thickness and the cross section of the bone, whether round or triangular or oval in section, are important because they were related to the amount of force and the kinds of forces that the bone would be subject to. For example, a human arm or a bird's wing are subject to bending forces. Finally, symmetry is very important in some kinds of bones, notably vertebrae. Once we have an idea of what body part a bone represents, we can start to think about what kind of animal it probably came from. For long bones, a lot of the differences we might anticipate relate to the function of the bone and the way the animal moves around. For example, an animal that walks on four legs, like this deer, will have bones in its appendicular skeleton that differ quite a lot from those in an animal that flies, like this owl. As you might expect, 
A lot of the differences are in the forearm bones, which have evolved into wings. Several bones more distal than the radius and ulna have fused into something called the carpometacarpus, which is only found in birds. But there are also other important differences related to flying. The sternum has evolved into a large structure called the carina that provides an anchor for the strong muscles that power the wings, or in the case of penguins, their flippers. And often the coracoids and clavicles are fused into a furculum or wishbone that serves as kind of struts for the wings. Since most birds don't do much walking on the ground, there are also differences in the feet. More generally, there are several common differences between mammalian bone and bird's bones. Although it's common to think that bird's bones are lighter, that's not always the case. Although bird's bones are hollow or semi-hollow, they're also denser in their cortical bone, and there can be internal strut-like structures in the bones. As I've already mentioned, often bones are fused together for strength and rigidity, and the humerus and ulna in birds' wings are round in section. That makes them less vulnerable to bending forces. Overall, these features make birds' bones stronger and more rigid than mammalian bones. The chart you see here kind of overgeneralizes, but I just wanted to make the point that in vertebrate animals, a lot of the differences you find in the appendicular skeleton are related to the way that the animal moves about. For example, in quadrupeds, the upper and lower limbs tend to be of similar length, and the distal parts of appendages vary depending on whether the animal uses them for grasping, walking, swimming, or flying. In fact, in snakes and some aquatic animals, some of these appendages have virtually or even entirely disappeared. Such functional differences affect the shapes of the bones in the appendages. To facilitate comparison, here all the bones are shown at different scales. In the femur, for example, the orangutans is somewhat similar to a human's because it sometimes walks on two legs. A horse's femur is very robust and shaped a bit differently to accommodate the strong muscles in a horse's hindquarters. A bat's femur is very slender because it doesn't use it for walking. Instead, it hangs upside down while resting. A pelican's femur is pretty robust too, not because it does a lot of walking, but it does swim on top of the water. A chicken's femur is of medium robustness, as it's another animal that walks on two legs. This lizard's femur is shaped a bit differently because lizards walk with their bodies close to the ground and their legs spread outwards. Turtles share that characteristic, but their bones are also wider and flatter to facilitate swimming. In a frog, however, the femur is slender and the ball joint or head of the femur is in line with the diaphysis, giving the femur a wide range of motion. In hooved animals like this horse, the bones that would be in a human's foot instead constitute the lower leg, and many of the bones are fused together, making them strong and rigid. Here I have examples of long bones from three different mammals, one of which walks on four legs and the other two swim. So here we have a humerus. Humerus would be this bone in here in the case of a human. Uh, so for us it's an arm that is for grasping and that sort of thing. Uh, but in the case of a caribou, uh, they walk on four legs, so the humerus has to be adapted in such a way that it helps uh, the caribou walk. Uh, and at the proximal end we have kind of a ball joint, and at the distal end we have this kind of, uh, it's hard to describe actually, this rounded part that would articulate with the radius and ulna in such a way that, that the humerus can move in this direction against them. And that's partly because of the way the, the, way the caribou's leg is shaped. Um, by contrast, uh, here we have the same bone, the humerus, from a seal. Um, aside from the fact that it's much smaller, uh, you can see they have th some things in common because they're both evolved from the same, uh, the same animal part in their ancestors, their common ancestors. So there's a ball at the proximal end of the humerus again. And again, we see that kind of rounded feature that w allows the humerus to move in this direction at the distal end of the humerus. But you'll notice the humerus in the seal is a lot flatter. Uh, it's not as round in cross-section. It's, it's, it's kind of flat in one portion and kind of triangular in another portion. Uh, and that's because it's adapted for swimming, not for walking. So it, it's basically designed uh, to go into a flipper that's to propel the seal through the water.
uh, and it's also fairly small because the flippers are not that large compared to an arm in a human or a leg of a caribou. Um, similarly, this, uh, this is a humerus from a beluga whale, another swimming mammal. Again, it has the ball at the proximal end here that allows a fair bit of rotation of the humerus. Uh, the distal end looks a little bit different than in the other two cases, uh, but it's still designed to articulate with a radius and an ulna, uh, which we have here. These probably aren't going to fit quite right because they're probably from different animals, or they might be from different animals. But one of the things that you'll notice immediately is that the radius and ulna uh, of, this, of this beluga whale are very flat and broad, again, because they're adapted to be flippers, not legs, or in this case, arms. Um, so they're still recognizable as radius and ulna. They have a lot of the features of a radius and ulna, but they're much flatter than we would find in, say, a human radius and ulna, which would be in our forearms. Here we see a comparison of humeri in a number of different species, again, not to scale. Again, we start with the orangutan, whose humerus has its head or ball joint arranged in such a way as to give it quite a wide range of motion. And again, the humerus in the horse is very robust and has places to attach very strong muscles. Here we see a rabbit's humerus. Although rabbits are technically quadrupeds, most of the power comes from their hindquarters, not their forearms. So the humerus is very slender. And here we see a dolphin's humerus. Not surprisingly, it's pretty similar to the beluga whale's humerus that we just saw. This one's a chicken's humerus. Even though chickens don't do much flying, this humerus is still pretty robust, presumably because the chicken's ancestors were flyers. And this unusual one is from a frog. It even has something like a ball joint at the distal end, presumably because of the way it swims. We also see significant differences among taxa in the lower forearms, namely the radius and ulna. In the orangutan, the radius is arched and the radius and ulna are spread apart, giving the orang strong forearms that would help it move through the trees. By contrast, in a cow, the radius and ulna are thick, robust, and close together, allowing them to support a lot of weight. In a cat, they're straight, slender, and close together. While in a bat, they're very slender and fused towards the distal end because they're part of the bat's wing. In a turkey, the radius and ulna are fairly robust and somewhat spread apart, giving them strength. As with chickens, even though turkeys don't do a lot of flying, these features probably exist because their ancestors flew. We'll end with the radius and ulna of a frog, which are fused together and broad and flat in order to facilitate swimming. Here I have some examples of flat bones, in this case scapulae. Here, for example, we have a scapula of a seal. I think it's a ring seal. And like its name implies, it's fairly flat. Uh, on one surface, it's a little bit concave, but mostly flat. The other side is mostly flat, except for a high kind of pointy ridge that runs along the scapula. And that would be for a muscle attachment, because a scapula, or shoulder, has to be strong in order to, uh, in this case, propel help to propel the seal through the water. Uh, here, we, on the other hand, we have a scapula of a caribou, or most of a scapula of a caribou. Uh, and it has some things in common with the, the seal scapula. Once again, they're both pretty flat. Uh, this one is also ki kind of concave on one surface, but has a little bit of ridge on one edge here. Uh, but, and then this surface is a little bit concave ex to flat, except for this long, high ridge that would be for muscle attachments again. Both of them have an articular surface that's kind of concave uh, that would allow it to articulate with the proximal end of the humerus. And since I happen to have a caribou, caribou humerus sitting here, let's see if I can figure out how that would go. Uh, these may not be from, the, they're probably not from the same animal, so it might, it might not be a great fit. But it would be, I think, something like that. But just to give you an idea, uh, the concave articular surface on the scapula would would fit in with a kind of ball joint on the proximal end of the humerus so that allowing the humerus to move kind of like that. Different kinds of animals vary considerably in the number of ways that we can estimate their age at death 
as well as in the precision of those estimates. For mammals, there are lots of different methods, but they vary a lot in their usefulness. For example, epiphyseal fusion and tooth eruption are only useful for pretty young animals. Tooth wear tends to lack in precision, and size can vary for other reasons besides age, such as sexual dimorphism or domestication. In addition, the elements to which we can apply some of these methods are not particularly common in the samples typically available to us. Others, like the texture of cortical bone, are more widely applicable but not particularly precise. We're luckier with some other animals, such as bony fish and mollusks, that often show periodic growth increments that can be seasonal or annual. On the other hand, it can be really difficult to age adult birds. In bony fish, seasonal growth in the centra of fish vertebrae allow us simply to count them in order to determine a fish's age, as long as the fish lived in waters with distinct seasonality. Similarly, there are annuli in the fish's otoliths, which we can just count in order to determine the fish's age. In some bivalves that occupy the intertidal zone along beaches, such as cockles, there's a new increment of shell growth at every high tide, and hundreds of these small increments are bundled into bands that represent a growing season, and they're separated from other such bands by periods of little or no growth. Consequently, when the growing season is annual, we only need to count these bands in order to determine the cockle's age. Going back to mammals, we can estimate the age of teeth on the basis of charts like this one for human teeth that associate age with degree of tooth wear. Here we see a similar chart for bison molars. However, in this instance, black represents enamel exposed on the occlusal surface rather than wear. A very useful method of aging mammals is to count the alternating opaque and translucent bands of cementum growth in the roots of teeth. There's some potential for error in this method because cementum can be resorbed or abraded, but it's generally one of the more precise methods available to us for mammals. Evidence for the sex of animals is also quite variable and can be quite limited. Some types of evidence, like pelvic shape in mammals, only applies to bones that may occur rarely within the archaeological sample. Features like horns or antlers can be rarer still. That's why zooarchaeologists often use more subtle size and shape differences among bones in order to distinguish males from females. This allows them to make use of a greater proportion of the sample that's available. But the ranges of morphometric measures for males and females often overlap considerably and size can vary for other reasons than sex, such as age or domestication. Sexing non-mammals can be particularly difficult. In birds, for example, it's pretty unlikely that our sample will include spurs from male birds, and the calcium deposits found in the medullary cavity of females' bones related to egg production are only visible when the bone is broken or sectioned. Where DNA is preserved, it's an excellent source of evidence for an animal's sex, but the extraction and analysis of the DNA is still expensive. Consequently, DNA analysis is still not widely used for sexing animal remains from archaeological sites. There are many published atlases of animal bones and other animal remains that we can use to identify specimens in archaeological collections and I've listed some of those at the end of this video. However, none of these are a real substitute for a reference collection, with thousands of taxa, each represented by specimens of varying age and sex. Forming such a collection takes a great deal of time and energy. Here you see some of the possible sources for specimens in such a collection. Animals accidentally killed on highways are one such source and sometimes we can access these by making agreements with various transport authorities. We can sometimes make arrangements with local zoos for animals that die while in their care. This can be a good way to acquire specimens of non-local animals. An obvious source for domesticated food animals is local butchers and meat packers.
while we might be able to obtain wild food animals from hunters, fishermen, or park services. Sadly, in urban areas, a lot of small birds meet their deaths by crashing into skyscrapers at night. These accidents can provide a source of specimens of such birds. Beaches are an obvious source of marine mollusk shell, as well as the bones of sea mammals. But usually it's difficult or impossible to obtain specimens of extinct animals, such as Pleistocene megafauna. To examine specimens of those, we usually have to visit a natural history museum. Finally, another good way to obtain specimens is through exchanges with other people's collections. We can give away duplicates from our own collection in order to obtain specimens that we don't currently have. For the collection to be useful, we have to maintain its quality. One of the most important aspects of this is documentation. Every specimen needs to be labeled with its species, sex, and approximate age at the time that it died. It's also helpful to record when and where it was collected. And after the specimen has been processed, we need to label the parts, including whether it's a left or a right element. Finally, we need to store the processed specimens in a safe, stable environment with low relative humidity, away from pests, and in with a clear organization so that we can find the specimens that we need. There are lots of different ways to process specimens for the collection, but most of us would not have access to bug rooms, which are very difficult to maintain. Some of the better options are outdoor burial or placement of the specimens in an intertidal zone, where various small organisms will eat away the fleshy parts. However, if you use this method, you need to make sure that the specimen is held in some kind of net or bag that won't lose any of the elements, and that you mark any burial locations very carefully so that you can find the specimen later on. These days, taking GPS coordinates is also a good idea. Once the specimens are defleshed, we still need to degrease them as well. Common methods for degreasing include heating them, but not boiling them, in ammonia or a degreasing detergent. The video you just saw focused on only the most basic aspects of zooarchaeology, namely the identification of animal remains and what they can tell us about the sex and age of the animal at the time of its death. There are many other aspects of zooarchaeology that I wasn't able to cover in such a short video or was only able to touch on very briefly. Among these would be uh, what the remains can tell us about ancient diet and foodways, and what they can tell us about climate change and the environment around the site, as well as the larger region within which people would have attained animals. If you'd like to learn more about zooarchaeology, please consult chapter 15 of my book, The Archaeologist Laboratory, published by Springer, as well as the references I've cited there, and you may also check out the links I've put down below. And if you'd like to be alerted when I publish new videos, please click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you, and stay safe.